morning. Uh, thanks for showing up. And uh, thanks to uh, CrowdSupply and everybody who's been involved in this conference. It's been great so far. I really appreciate it coming back again to Portland. My name is, is Scott, and uh, I will be talking about um, something that, that doesn't always get a lot of representation uh, in, in the kinds of, uh, of educational materials that are available, uh, both to students when they're coming through uh, training and also just in terms of the general uh, maker community. And that is, uh, how do you go from a new board that uh, shows up on your, on your workbench that's been assembled to something that has been um, powered up and tested and verified without uh, hopefully as, or with as little drama hopefully as possible. Um, when I uh, was putting this talk together, I had sort of a, a particular audience in mind and it may or may not be appropriate to the, the people who showed up, but I was thinking mostly about people who at uh, present are doing designs with Arduinos and off the shelf commercially available uh, shields uh, and sort of stacking things together and writing firmware uh, to develop their projects, but who are interested in going beyond that, doing a custom design of some sort. And the, uh, the typical design that you would sort of see from that kind of a, of a project would be something with a microprocessor. Sorry, I'm make sure I have this closer to my mouth. Uh, a microprocessor, some sort of sensors or actuators to interact with the real world. Um, Communications of some sort, uh, maybe simple serial communications, maybe Wi-Fi or, or uh, Bluetooth or some other wireless protocol or a display, uh, and then some sort of power, battery or uh, a wall ward or something. I'm not going to talk about mains power projects because there's a whole different set of, of safety concerns there that I don't really want to get into. Um, and if you think about that whole process, there's a lot of, of information available about how to design boards, how to use things like KiCad, and how to get boards manufactured by our friends at uh, Osh Park and other places. Um, there's lots of tutorials about how to solder uh, and build your boards. Uh, and certainly lots of information, especially coming from the Arduino environment, about how to develop firmware once you get things running. But there's this little middle part about how to go from something you've designed to something that, that functions well enough that you can continue on using it. And that's what I really would like to talk about. As I say, I'm, a lot of this is going to be sort of uh, aimed at someone who's not gone through the process before, but hopefully there'll be a few little nuggets for people who are more experienced. And, and if I forget things and you have experience in this area, you can certainly chime in at any point and, uh, and help out. But before we get to the actual process of taking a board from um, showing up uh, from whoever has assembled it uh, to uh, functionality. I'd like to step back in time a little bit and talk about the things you can do ahead of time during the design process, during the planning process of a project to make life a little easier as you go forward. Uh, and in many things, you know, preparation is a really important part of this. If you, if you spend the time up front and, uh, and try and anticipate some of the problems and try and incorporate features that help you later on, uh, you're a long way down the road to getting the job done. Of course, ex execution matters as well, and, uh, <laughs> and we'll get back to that too, but uh, I think, you know, this is sort of why projects take longer than you think. Uh, so let's talk about the preparation process. Um, I think, uh, first of all, that um, Greg Peak at last year's teardown talked about a lot of uh, some of the things that I'm going to repeat and a lot of other things that make your designs uh, more easily um, used by others and also a bit more easily used by your, uh, or yourself as you go forward. Uh, that uh, talk is, on, uh, is available on video. I encourage you to go back for it because there's some things that I won't repeat, but there are a um, number of things that I will. Uh, the most important thing that I th would like to leave you with, I think, in this whole talk is don't expect to make your first iteration your final product. Um, there's always a temptation to do that. People, we all sort of are reluctant to spend money and time on new spins of boards and, uh, and the iterative process, but uh, 
if you accept the fact that you're going to have to make a prototype, um, that frees you up from a lot of things. It frees you up from sort of the, uh, the paralysis of perfection, for one thing. Uh, and it also allows you to incorporate a lot of features in the prototype that make your life easier during the development process, but which not, are not necessarily useful or necessary in a final product. You can spend board real estate on things that, um, that don't provide functionality to your product in the end, but which allow you to uh, overall, probably, or at least I would like to encourage you to think so, uh, make the overall process faster and, and less painful. So what kinds of things are those? Well, the main one is test points. If, you, um, if you're willing to spend the board real estate uh, and accept that the prototype is something you're going to do, then you can put in what I would consider good test points. And we'll talk about good and bad on test points in, as we go along here. But um, mechanically stable uh, is a big thing as you're... Um, going uh, through the process of development, and uh, easy and quick to, to connect correctly. Um, one way of doing that is to consider doing a test fixture, even for a prototype. Um, it's not something that a lot of people do, although I've done commercial products uh, where that's been part of the, the prototyping process. And there's a whole industry uh, around uh, developing test fixtures, uh, both doing the entire job of generating test fixture, but there's also people uh, like uh, who sell these kinds of reusable um, boxes that, that you can build test fixtures around. Um, they're not super expensive, and, and uh, even getting a custom test fixture done professionally is not necessarily all that expensive. Um, it's certainly a kind of thing for professional products that you might consider. In addition, I mean, if you're planning on it going to production with a, pro with a project at some point, you're going to have to do this kind of thing for the production line anyway, and getting started on thinking about tests and test fixtures even early on is not a bad practice. Um, if you're not doing it professionally, uh, there's a lot of uh, information out on the web about doing 3D printed or laser cut test fixtures that are customized for your board. Um, there's a, uh, a number of projects on Thingiverse, for example, for, that uh, provide you with sort of adaptable um, templates for these sorts of things. And so that's, a, that's one way to go. If you don't want to do that, um, well, let me, let me back up for a second. Um, the, the downside to doing a, a test fixture is that if you change your design, then you're going to have to do it again. It's also a, uh, an additional expense that you may or may not want to uh, take the time to uh, and, and money to do. Uh, so if you choose not to, then uh, put in a lot of good test points. And I don't, <laughs> by good, I don't mean wires soldered onto vias and components. Um, that's a last resort. It's not a good practice. Uh, we've probably, or many of us have certainly seen and even perpetrated uh, these sort of test bed monstrosities where there's a lot of wires coming off of a board and they're tacked onto various bits and pieces of the, of the circuit board. And if you're very lucky, you don't, you know, accidentally knock the thing over and rip something off your board or throw it onto the floor and uh, pull down some of your test equipment. Um, so don't do that. <laughs> uh, similarly, uh, although it's at least mechanically a little more stable, just bare copper test points scattered around your board is not the best practice. Um, it's better than, um, you know, scraping uh, the solder mask off of a trace and soldering to that, for example, or on a component. But really, I would advocate doing stable mechanical connections, pin headers or connectors, uh, something that um, preferably is through hole, although um, that costs you board real estate on both sides of your, of your design or all the way through if it's a multi-layer board. Uh, but uh, they're a lot more mechanically stable and if you're unplugging and plugging things a lot, um, surface mount pin headers in my experience have a tendency to rip pads off the boards. Um, so if you can afford the real estate, do through hole pin headers that are really mechanically <coughs> solid 
Uh, and you can either, you know, scatter them around the board as uh, sort of single uh, test points, or you can preferably put them into multi-pin connectors. Uh, and the reason for that, or the main reason for that, is that not only do you want things that are mechanically stable, but you also want things that are quick to disconnect and connect correctly. And the disadvantage with a bunch of individual connections that you have to uh, connect uh, in a particular order it, uh, is that uh, there's this chance that you'll do it wrong the next time you need to do it, and you'll waste a lot of time uh, chasing problems that might not be there. And there's also just a, a sort of a, uh, a, a cognitive drag on having to do that. So if you need to reuse a piece of test equipment and you disconnect it from your project, and then you come back and you have to reconnect uh, seven test probes in the right order or in the right uh, positions, you may just not feel like doing it because it's a, it's a pain in the neck and, and then spend time uh, less efficiently debugging your board. So reducing mental drag and reducing this sort of friction to doing things right is an important part of this as well. Uh, so where should you do test points? Well, ideally everywhere. Uh, if you're spending the real estate to do it, then do it on things that you don't even think you'll need. Uh, so certainly all the power rails and provide good grounds that are convenient to use for analog signals. You want to provide the appropriate test points with, if necessary, good connectors that allow you to connect uh, with signal integrity. Uh, and that includes having good nearby ground points so that if you have to probe things, you can do it with short ground leads. All the buses that either come in and off of your board or that go between chips on your board um, should all be uh, provided with test points. All the GPIOs that you're going to use, and including some that you don't think you're going to use because it's always useful to have a few extra GPIOs that you can use for debugging or for performance testing of your programs. And certainly, a programming or debugging lines that you need, do those with connectors. Uh, I've seen and I've participated in projects where you have to hold a programming lead on with one hand and try to type with the other hand to program the board, uh, and that just doesn't work very well. Uh, particularly, it's not a practical way to do it if you're doing debugging and doing sort of long-term development. So put on decent connectors for all those things. Um, you can always take them off later after you get your board working. Uh, one of the uh, nice kinds of uh, power monitoring uh, uh, test point setups that I've seen is to put sense resistors, or at least the pads for sense resistors, in line with all your power rails. Um, the one coming into the board, if you have multiple power domains, then to all of them. Uh, and also think about doing the same thing uh, for the different uh, important sub-circuits of your design. Um, and the nicest way that I've seen to do this is to do it with uh, not only a sense resistor on the, uh, in line with the power rail, but also to put uh, right beside that uh, two test points that um, are on either side of the resistor. And that way you can, uh, if you don't want to use a sense resistor, you can just put a standard jumper on them. Uh, if you choose to disconnect part of your board because you want to uh, isolate that or, or test it separately or whatever, you can do it by pulling a jumper off. And you can also attach um, two leads across those, those two test points to measure the power draw by looking at the voltage drop across your resistor. And that's very helpful for doing uh, power optimization, uh, particularly if you um, do it for all the sub-circuits in your board, then you can uh, watch as you, say, run the program or, or do some uh, tests to see where on your board the power is going. Um, so this is something that really, uh, particularly for battery-powered devices, is a really nice thing to do. Uh, spend the time to label your boards, put useful information on there, uh, certainly signal labels, voltage levels if there's useful information about voltages that you expect at certain points, I squared C addresses for devices it's useful to have. Uh, try and avoid having to go back and fire up your, your computer and pull up the schematic or the, the board layout to get information. I mean, again, it's reducing friction. You put the things on there that you think you'll be using so that you can get it from the board and not have to bounce back and forth and context switch. <coughs> 
Um, start thinking while you're doing the development of your board, while you're doing the planning and, and, uh, and um, component selection and design about the test plan. Uh, how are you going to verify the different parts of your board? What kind of test code are you going to need to use? What's the sort of minimum uh, bit of test firmware that you need to start verifying functionality? Um, as part of the component uh, selection process, you might want to start before you really even design the board with uh, development boards or breakout boards to try and verify that the components you're going to select are ones that you can easily drive. Uh, find, try and find places where you can get code that you think is reliable for these. Look at example code from the manufacturer or other sources um, so that you can come into the bring up process with code that you don't have to debug before you can debug your board. You know, you'd like to have something you can rely on to test your board without having, uh, a, as, to have less unknowns basically in the process, right? So um, also think about the other side. If you're uh, communicating with the outside world from your board, what is it you're going to need on the other side of those communications to test them? If you're doing an RF design, how are you going to generate uh, test signals and, and, um, and verify that your radio is working? Or even if you're doing just simple serial communication, uh, what do you need to send back and forth? Uh, are there issues with stepwise testing of your design? Uh, can you, you know, what's the order in which you have to bring things up so that you can test them? Are there dependencies there that make that hard to do? Uh, what parts of the boards need to be brought up before something else can be tested? Uh, and try and, you know, think through that process and work around problems that you might see there before you design your board. Uh, and as I said, what kind of external test signals are you going to need? You know, radio um, on the other side uh, or uh, some voltage level that you need to test the sensor? Uh, what is it that you're going to need uh, in terms of test equipment or PC so software or um, other equipment that you might need to do the testing? Um, and again, uh, you know, the test plan thing is something that uh, Certainly, if you're going to make more than a few of, you're going to have to have a good test methodology for your boards anyway, and you might as well start thinking about that up front because in many cases, certainly in professional uh, uh, environments, the test plan and the test code and the test fixture for a board is as much work as the board and the firmware for the product itself. So the earlier you start and the more you think about how you can do that, the, the better off you're going to be. Um, so then we can hopefully um, have a, a well-prepared process in mind and have uh, lots of good test points and lots of other information on your board. And let's talk a little bit about execution. What do you do when you get the board? Uh, first of all, what kind of equipment might you need? Well, actually, not a lot. Um, you certainly need a multimeter in order to uh, to. Uh, measure voltages and resistance. Uh, I mean, it can be a really cheap multimeter. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Um, a current limiting power supply is a really nice thing to have because that allows you to power up the board in a controlled way without um, necessarily putting too much current in it right away. Um, if you have a, a microprocessor on board, you certainly need a, a programmer and a debugger. Uh, and really, that's sort of the basics. Uh, I've done commercial projects where that was all the equipment we ever used to, to bring the board up and develop the firmware. Um, a logic analyzer is another thing that might be useful, certainly a thing that you might want to have in your toolkit. And those don't necessarily have to be very expensive. You can look at the uh, SIGROC project, an open source project for doing um, uh, analysis of signals that um, is compatible with a lot of inexpensive logic analyzers, including things from you know, China for $10. Uh, so that doesn't necessarily have to be an expensive thing. Um, if you're generating signals uh, as input or output from your board or you need to uh, generate test signals to stimulate parts of your board, then you might think about what you need there. Uh, there are things like uh, the, the Bus Pirate, which is a um, sort of a hobby level um, 
uh, signal generator and, and an uh, analyzer for I squared C and SPI signals and uh, lots of other kinds of serial and, and parallel protocols. Uh, and then there are many others that you could, you could look at as well there. Uh, and, you know, you might, if you're really uh, feeling flush, you could use an oscilloscope, but it's not something that you typically would need for the kinds of designs that I'm talking about. Um, so the first thing you might do when you get an assembled board or you finish assembling your board is just do some basic uh, construction checks. Uh, check the soldering and component placement. Look for solder bridges and bad joints and, and components that are not um, making good contact. Uh, check all the ICs for orientation. Uh, check all the polarized components for orientation. So make sure that you put your uh, microprocessor down with pin one in the right part of the board. Uh, make sure that your diodes and, and polarized capacitors are the right way around, all those sorts of things. Uh, check for things like just stray solder, excess flux, and bits and pieces of wire and things like that that uh, are around your board. And do all this stuff before you get tempted to, to plug it in. Um, do some electrical checks before you do it. Check, uh, use your multimeter to check for shorts between uh, all your power rails and ground. Um, if you find a, a really low resistance between your positive voltage and ground, then that's something you really have to deal with before you plug the board in. Um, and do that for any other uh, power domains that you might have on the board. If you have a regulator on board, do it before and after the regulator. Uh, verify the polarity of all the power inputs. Uh, you know, if you're uh, plugging a particular kind of connector into your board to power it, make sure that you got plus and minus the right way around. Uh, I've made that mistake and had a plug that was the wrong way around, and it's not a necessarily a pretty thing to do. Uh, similarly for batteries, you know, make sure that you've, you've got plus and minus right. Um, and then you can think about plugging your board in. Uh, make an estimate of what you think a reasonable current draw would be for the board before it's programmed and so on. So remember that most of the components are probably not going to be active until you start programming things and turning them on. And you know, factor that into your current estimate. Set that on your uh, power supply and, and plug things in. Um, and then verify that the current draw is reasonable, is in the, the range of your expectations. If it's too high and your current limiting kicks in on your uh, power supply, then you need to rethink what's going on. I'm not going to really talk about sort of the debugging process. It's a whole other talk about um, uh, kinds of tricks and, and techniques that you can use for that. But these are all things that, that should stop you and put you into that mode if, if they aren't working. Verify the voltages in and other power rails that you've got. That's where those test points are, are really handy for on the power rails. Uh, make sure every, uh, every IC is getting the power you expect it to get. Uh, and if you have a microprocessor on board, you probably have either a crystal or some other kind of oscillator. Uh, and if you have the equipment, it's useful to verify that that's actually working at the frequency that you expect it to, because if it isn't, then your microprocessors are not going to work. Uh, but that's sort of an optional thing, and, and many times you don't have the equipment to do that. If all that looks good, then uh, move on to functionality tests. Uh, hook up a programmer, try to verify that it sees the microprocessor, recognizes it for what it is supposed to be, whether you can start programming it uh, with some simple code. Uh, and then from that point on, really, what you do is dependent very much on what your board is supposed to do, and that's where the, your, your test plan that you were thinking about earlier on starts to come into effect. You start putting on your initial test code uh, and sort of step by step uh, verifying the functionality and doing what you need to do to uh, verify that all of the parts of your board are doing what you expect them to do. Um, and again, that's the thing where you want to think about what the minimum code and uh, what the most reliable code you can find is to do that so that you can uh, easily verify that at least the basic functionalities of all the parts of your board are working. Uh, and then you really get into you know, firmware development, and that's where the rest of the process um, 
just sort of flows from, from there. And uh, I would say that even when you get beyond just sort of verifying all of the basic functionality and powering your board up, the prototype with test points and all of the useful information is going to be hugely valuable as you do firmware development as well. Um, and so, you know, develop, uh, doing the time, taking the time to do the planning and the preparation is going to pay off not only in, in uh, making it possible to bring the board up quickly and, and verify functionality, but also uh, in the longer term process of doing firmware development. So, you know, just to sum up, um, embrace the prototype. That's something that really I can't stress enough. Accept the fact that you're going to make mistakes to begin with and that you're going to have to iterate your project. Even the simplest of projects can have the most amazing failure modes that you don't expect. Um, and even if you're very experienced, you can, believe me, make those mistakes. And so just accept that and live with it and take advantage of it. Uh, prepare well. Certainly, you know, if you're designing the board yourself, spend the time to think through the process of what you need to do uh, an efficient overall process and not just what the functionality of the final product needs to be. Uh, and then, you know, execute methodically. Don't skip steps. Uh, it's easy to do. You get excited. You want to see your board working. But, you know, go through the steps. Uh, and that's it. I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks for coming. Yeah, have you ever used JTAG boundary scan in your bringing up a board? That's something that uh, used to be a lot more common, in my understanding, with signal uh, analysis kinds of tools and things like that. Um, and most of the sort of, of projects in, in this uh, sort of domain that I'm talking about really probably don't go to that level. Um, you certainly want to make sure that your programmer recognizes any of the chips that it's supposed to, to see, like uh, if you have a spy flash on there that you want to talk to, you want to make sure that you can see that on the chain and so on. But yeah, that, that really comes into play when you have a lot more complex boards with multiple things on a JTAG uh, chain. Uh, I guess I would say, well, first of all, um, yeah, thank you for, uh, <laughs> for thinking about embracing the prototype. Uh, it's, uh, in terms of, of uh, sort of version control, I guess I'm a big believer in using a real version control system. And uh, even if you're doing a project yourself, certainly in, in larger professional organizations, there's an entire uh, infrastructure for engineering change orders and tracking things and stuff like that. But if you don't have that access to uh, to those sorts of tools, then use Git or something like that um, to just track issues. You know, make sure that you keep notes um, along with your project to uh, tie, and you can tie those to versions of your schematic that you check in as well, so that the you know you can keep track of, uh, keep a correspondence between the issues you solved and and the versions of the schematic and and board that you're uh, generating. And that reminds me, you should also obviously put version numbers on your, on your board so that you know what it was when you come back to it. Um, that's another very useful thing to put on the board. I put dates too. Dates is good too, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, particularly if you can track back in, in your Git history and see you know, what this version was supposed to have corrected and connect that with the specific issues. That's a really useful thing if you come back later to a board. Other questions? <laughs>
I mean, that's the simplest thing. Uh, or really, ideally, you used, you know, keyed shrouded headers, so there's really only one way you can plug things in and you can't get it wrong. Uh, but, you know, 0.5, in, uh, 0.05 inch 50 mil headers is good too if you can, uh, I mean, there's a bit of a, it depends on what you can make uh, connectors for easily. I, I really think that it's worth taking the time to make up, um, you know, multi uh, wire connectors that plug into connectors for these things. It's an extra time sink, and for 50 mil headers, it's a little bit harder to do. For 0.1 inch, it's really pretty easy. You just have to have a little crimper in it. It's really not very hard. It's another one of those skills that a little practice and you get pretty good at. Uh, and then it means that you can just plug things in and it, everything's hooked up right. You don't have any ambiguities. Uh, and it's worth the time up front. Again, one of those preparation things. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, that's a whole other talk in a way uh, because there's a lot of sort of t tricks of the trade. Uh, shorts are, are one where uh, that's another place where having the multiple inline sense resistors is a really useful thing because you can isolate particular parts of your board. So if you have a short, you can isolate that part of the board and, and if it goes away, then you know it's in that part of the circuit. So. That's just sort of a simple mechanical way to do it. I mean, there is test equipment. There are short finders that, um, that are basically milli-ohm uh, measurement things that you can use to home in on where shorts are. Um, but um, I've never had a terrific amount of luck with those. <laughs> uh, but sort of, you know, pulling components if you have to, really, to, to start seeing where things are is really the most effective way that I've found, honestly. Thermal cameras, if you're really uh, pumping the, pumping the uh, uh, current into the board, yeah, for sure. Um, but if you don't have a thermal camera, you can, uh, you can use the uh, isopropanol trick of just, you know, putting it on the board and see where it evaporates fastest. <laughs> that works pretty well, actually. All right, well, thanks very much.